Hello, my name is Andrew Clark. I'm a writer and publisher of Northeast History Books. A popular subject in my books is Days at the Seaside. Before holidays abroad became more common, most people enjoyed spending their leisure time at the coast. So together, let's remember fairground rides, Candy Rock, knitted bathing suits and plodging in the sea as we take a trip to the seaside resorts of our region. An aerial view of Tynemouth Long Sands in the 1930s with that marvellous building, the plaza, towering above the visitors. At this time, the plaza was known as the Gala Land and Ballroom Fantastique. And in this photograph, the name Gala Land can be seen on the roof. Look how packed the beach is with also many in the sea. The seaside was the place to go at weekends, bank holidays, and the annual holidays during the summer months. This photograph shows the beach at Redcar in the 1950s, another popular destination for the day tripper. Families, friends and neighbours gathered in groups at their favourite spot, and you would need to get there early in the morning to secure a good place. Some hired tents for the day, and inside you would change into your bathing costume so you could swim in the sea. Others had a windbreak as protection from the elements. And who remembers struggling to put on your swimwear while holding a towel around you at the same time? Not easy. A happy family group with their dog on Newbiggin Beach in the 1930s. They've hired deck chairs for the day. Many Northumberland miners and their families would spend their free time at Newbiggin by the sea. Trips to the course were often family outings, but there were also more organised excursions by Sunday schools or working men's clubs. Sometimes whole streets and communities would travel together to enjoy themselves at the seaside. Here we see dozens of buses ready to leave concert for the Poor Bairns trip to Whitley Bay in 1923. In the 1920s and 30s, there were a number of organisations who would arrange for a day at the seaside for children. One gentleman from Gateshead told me the story of the time he went on a poor bairns trip before the Second World War. He said a group of children were taken to Amble and the highlight of the day was when they got their food. Their lunch was a pie, but when you were given it, your hand was stamped so you couldn't have another one. This gentleman could remember it clearly, and he told me how he and his friends hid round the corner while they ate their pies. Then they rubbed off the mark on their hands so they could go back and claim another pie. This photograph shows a busy scene at Pegswood Railway Station in the 1950s. This was their annual trip to Whitley Bay for dozens of families from this Northumberland village. The train must have been packed, and by the look of the clothes they are wearing, top coats and one lady with a headscarf, it was probably a cold day. If you were off to Tynemouth by train, you would get off at the wonderful station seen here in this coloured postcard from the early 1900s. A guidebook from before the First World War gave this description of the station. As he alights from the train at Tynemouth Station, the visitor might also almost be led to believe he had entered a conservatory instead of a railway station. So numerous are the tasteful floral decorations on the platforms. He gets decidedly good impressions and, if unencumbered with luggage, will probably set out for a stroll around the streets. In recent years, the word staycation has become used as a term for those who spend their holidays near home. In this advert from 1970, at-home holidays were being offered. The advert says, see the beauty of the North at little expense. Return to the comfort of your home each evening. Tours of the coast or the town or country were on offer from prices of £7, 10 shillings or eight pounds. So what were the destinations for days at the seaside? 
There was, of course, Whitley Bay, seen here in the 1930s. It had the attraction of the Spanish city, the fair, and the many cafes, guest houses, and hotels. In this postcard, we can see the Waverley Hotel, later to be known as the Rex. The hotel gave an excellent view of the sea, and around 1920 was described as having accommodation for 100 guests. It also had a lounge, billiard room, large garage, tennis courts, and first-class cuisine. Later in the 20s, the hotel was extended and the accommodation doubled. Just down the course from Whitley Bay is Colour Courts. This postcard from the 1930s shows the harbour. In the foreground, a group of lads enjoy their time in a boat. This is one of my favourite old picture postcards. Three girls relax on a boat in Colour Courts Bay in the early 1900s. Colour Courts was an ideal spot for those who wanted to take boats out the sea. And along from Colour Courts is Tynemouth. In this colour postcard from before the First World War, we see the Long Sands. This is a description of Tynemouth from a guidebook dated 1912. The Long Sands are seen to advantage from the Palace Theatre, and the descent there too is easy. They form an admirable playground, being broad and smooth and extending in a graceful curve for considerable length. Their central portion is the best for bathing purposes. Adjoining the Long Sands is King Edward's Bay, a charming little sheltered cove which is exceedingly popular. An afternoon spent on the sands watching the youngsters at play with bucket and spade or studying the various characteristics of the good-natured crowd need be by no means dull. While the rocks and pools are a constant source of attraction to many visitors, old and young. Northumbrians never wait to be amused, but they are ever enterprising in finding means for beguiling the hours spent on the margin of the sea. A favourite destination in Northumberland is Newbiggin by the Sea. This photograph shows the promenade and beach in the 1930s. The promenade was opened in 1932 as part of the seaside development of the town. There are a number of places to go in County Durham. This is a packed beach at Crimden near Hartlepool. You can see lots of tents that could be hired for the day for about half a crown, two shillings and sixpence. While a deck chair would be about threepence for three hours, with a fourpence refundable deposit if returned within that time. Another County Durham resort is Seaton Carew. And here are two young lads enjoying a donkey ride on the beach around 1970. The boy on the left, is me. Closer to home is South Shields, and this is the promenade in the 1930s. An advert for South Shields and Mars and Bay from after the Second World War gave this description. There's no finer place in Britain for a happy family holiday. Miles of golden sand, safe bathing, and an endless variety of things to do and see. In Sunderland, there's Roker and Seaburn. This advert says, a day's outing is perfect for the family at Roker and Seaburn, the holiday resort on your doorstep. And it lists the many attractions of Roker and Seaburn. Here's Seaburn in the 1950s with those distinctive kiosks on the right where you could buy food and souvenirs. Local author Peter Gibson has fond memories of Seaburn. He says, you would queue for hot water at Notriani's to make tea on the beach, while your food would be seaside or sandy sandwiches as we call them. They were normally egg and tomato. You might also have chips with fish if you could afford it. There were donkey rides making sandcastles and plodging. 
the activities were occasionally disturbed by an announcement over the public address system that a child had been found. The child's description was usually accompanied by distraught wailing in the background. For those looking at for other things to do at Seaburn, there was the boating pool, crazy golf, the miniature railway, and of course the fair, which was dominated by the impressive Big Dipper. Along from Seaburn is Roca, and this postcard from the early 1900s shows the pier and the lighthouse in the background. In the foreground is a maze, one of the attractions of this resort at that time. Staying at Roca, we have this lovely image of children plodging in the sea. Do you remember as a child taking off your socks and shoes to dip your feet in the water? and then trying to get all the sand off your feet to get your socks and shoes back on. In the background of this photograph is Holy Rock, most of which was demolished in the 1930s as it became unsafe due to erosion. The next series of photographs show people enjoying time in or on the sea. A postcard titled Mixed Bathing at Whitley Bay this recalls a time when men and women would not always be seen together on the beach. Another postcard, this time titled Making a Splash at Whitley Bay. It shows the Table Rock swimming pool from the 1930s. A visitor's guide from 1920 gave this description of the Table Rocks. Just below the bandstand at the south end of the main promenade lie the Table Rocks. An open saltwater bath, which has been blasted out of solid rock, is a considerable attraction for bathers. It is 70 feet long, five feet deep at one end and three and a half feet deep at the other, and is covered by the sea at every high tide so that the water never becomes stale. A number of dressing rooms have recently been erected so that bathers may now disrobe in comfort and thus avoid the predicament of many have had on windy days of emerging from the bath to find their garments in sundry parts of the rocks. This image shows the children's paddling pool at Whitley Bay. How many of you recall when young wearing a lovely knitted swimsuit made by your mother or even your grandmother. Remember the feeling when you first went into the sea. That costume felt like you were in a sack of potatoes with the amount of water it could hold and how it stretched. So that same swimsuit that was made to fit when you were two or three years old would still be around when you were five, six or even older. Along the course of Tynemouth was the outdoor pool. It's shown here in the late 1920s when a swimming gala was taking place. At this time, the charges for the pool were fourpence for adults and twopence for children. Swimming costumes and towels could also be hired. Chairs around the bathing pool were a penny. Another one of my favourite postcards shows the rough sea crashing against Tynemouth Outdoor Pool in the late 1920s. Sadly, the pool has been in a very poor condition for decades and is no longer usable. However, a community group in Tymouth is exploring the possibility of bringing it back to its former glory. Hiring a boat to go on the sea was popular. And here is a lovely image of the sands at Whitley Bay. You can see shuggy boats in the background and on the right, a helter skelter where you ride down the slide on a mat. An advert for motor boat trips from South Shields before the Second World War. The photograph shows them loading from one of the local beaches. Trips were to St Mary's Island off Whitley Bay, Marsden Rock and around the harbour. There was also a trip up the Tyne to Wrighton Willows, a favourite destination in the country for many years. Youngsters plodging in the sea off Whitley Bay Sands 
after the Second World War. A small jetty leads to a port for pleasure rides along the coast. On the horizon to the right is St Mary's Lighthouse. Another old postcard shows very well-dressed well children with buckets and spades on the promenade of Whitley Bay in the early 1900s. Generations of children have enjoyed making sandcastles with buckets and spades just like these young ones. Our next selection of images shows some of the attractions on the beach and the land. A great old photograph of a sandcastle competition on the beach at Whitley Bay in August 1908. The proud winner with a very well made sandcastle is in the centre. Again, everyone is well dressed and nearly all wearing hats. Even after the Second World War, you could still see men wear suits on the beach. However, to get into the holiday spirit, the men might wear a knotted handkerchief on their heads. A popular attraction on the beach used to be sugar boats, seen here at Tynemouth around 1910. On the far right is the Grand Hotel. Here's a close-up of the shuggy boat, or shuggy shoe, as some people called them. You pulled on a rope to make it swing. On the left is a boy about to go down an early form of a zip line, which is an inclined aerial rope that you ride down on an attached seat. Another ride on the beach was the Helter Skelter. This postcard from the early 1900s has this message written on it. The ride on the mat. Eric always comes back minus the seat of his cordies where he's been having a ride on it. And now a very popular destination for visitors when you're in Whitley Bay, the Spanish city. Here we have the building of the dome of the Spanish city with workmen posing for the camera with what looks like very few safety precautions. It was opened in 1910 and 10 years later, a tourist guide gave this description. The permanent buildings comprise a handsome and stately rotunda of a height of 60 feet, the dome being supported by massive Corinthian columns. A wide and lofty gallery also encircles the rotunda. From this beautiful central hall, access is obtained to the new ballroom, which has been altered and entirely redecorated at considerable expense. After standing empty for a number of years, this iconic building was reopened in 2018. The Spanish City Pleasure Gardens had some of the best fairground rides in the Northeast. The guide from 1920 listed some of these attractions. There was the water shoot, figure eight railway, social whirl, joy wheel, flying airships, hall of laughter, maze, rainbow wheel, together with a host of sideshows. This advert from before the First World War says the Pleasure Gardens were an ideal pleasure park on this bracing and invigorating coast, replete with the latest amusement devices. Admission to the grounds at this time was threepence. Here's the Rainbow Pleasure Wheel at Whitley Bay around 1914. Another ride was the Social Whirl. A postcard of this ride from 1909 had the following message on the back. This is one of the greatest attractions at Whitley Bay. I did not venture on it myself, but it was great fun watching the people that were getting tumbled about. A colour postcard of people flying around and off the joy wheel. Here's the water shoot being tested around 1910. To the left is the figure eight roller coaster. 
and now a great postcard showing the water chute in action. There was also a fun fair at Seaburn. This postcard from the early 1960s shows the boating lake and amusement park with the towering roller coaster. On the back of this postcard is the message, having a lovely time, weather not too bad. Another fun fair is at South Shields, and unlike Whitley Bay and Seaburn, it is still going strong today. In Tynemouth was this landmark building, the Plaza. This postcard from the early 1900s was when it was called the Palace. It was originally opened as the Tynemouth Aquarium and Winter Garden in 1878. The enterprise, unfortunately, was not a success and 10 years after opening was sold with the Winter Garden becoming a theatre. Corrugated iron replaced the glass roof. This photograph shows the interior. There was another overhaul in 1927 and a name changed to the Plaza, the name best remembered by local people. Many I've spoken to remember Happy Days roller skating here. A view showing the plaza with a busy beach below. Sadly, this wonderful structure was destroyed in a fire in 1996. This postcard from before the First World War shows the sands at Whitley Bay. After a long day at the coast, you would need some refreshment. You can see in this image that overlooking the beach is Greg's Colossal Calf. At this time, it had seating for over 1,000 people with 50 windows that faced the sea. There was a special picnic room that could seat 400 and the calf had its own bakery. There were many other calves at Whitley Bay and other resorts and most people had their favourites. Another treat on your day out at the coast would be ice cream. And here's an advert for Mr Whippy, who had a factory at Dunstan. As well as ice cream, another seaside tradition was Candy Rock, and this is a stall in South Shields selling both in the early 1980s. This postcard of Whitley Bay from the 1920s has on the left a shop advertising pure Whitley Rock stamped right through. At Colour Coast for many years, you were able to buy seafood from the doors of the cottages on the front street. This photograph is from the 1950s. While at the seaside, you would often buy a souvenir or a postcard. This is the Whitley postcard shop that was in the Spanish city. Many of the images I've used in this talk were originally old picture postcards. Postcards first appeared in 1894, with their golden age starting around 1900 with the introduction of improved printing. Over 400 million postcards were sent at the start of that century, and by 1918, that figure had doubled. Their photos provide historic records, while their messages were like we send a text or email today. A postcard sent from Whitley Bay before the First World War had this message written on the back. Dear mother and father, the weather is awful here. It's pouring with rain and the wind is nearly knocking the tent over. But we are happy. We slept in a flooded tent last night. My chest has kept fine so far as the air seems to agree with me. Not everyone went to the seaside just for the day, with some staying overnight. This comic postcard shows a packed boarding house at Whitley Bay. One lady from Winlayton told me that when she was younger, her family could afford a few nights in a guest house in Whitley Bay. This was just after the Second World War, and in those days, it was rare to go away for more than just a day trip. 
When the taxi arrived in their street to take them to the local train station, she said many of their neighbours came out to wave them off as if they were going on a long journey. In the years either side of the Second World War, children often stayed at school camps. This is a postcard of the school camp at Blackhall Rocks near Hartlepool, which was sent to Windermere Street, Gateshead in 1937. It had this message. I am enjoying myself immensely down here. Miss Lickfield is my teacher and we begin lessons tomorrow. I wish you were here as well. I hope you were in the pink again. Funds were raised to send Gateshead children to the camp at Blackhall. Few families at this time could afford a holiday, so a week away near the sea would have been a great adventure for a youngster. This is a photograph and headline from the Gateshead Weekly Pictorial Post from June 1939. It featured the story of the Gateshead Breakfast Committee taking 500 children for a day's outing to South Shields. They left Gateshead at 10 to 9 and were entertained to lunch in the Poor Children's Holiday Association hut on the beach. Tea was served at 3 p.m. The Pictorial Post reported, although the weather was not too kind, these little kiddies had a thoroughly spanking time, as can be seen from these happy smiling faces captured by our camera. Many a little head fell as sound asleep on the journey home, with hands tightly clasped around their stick of rock. It will be a day long to remember in the lives of these kiddies. My final photograph shows a long queue of people waiting to board a train at Whitley Bay Station to take them home after a day at the coast. I've come to the end of my talk and I hope you've enjoyed it with the photographs and stories bringing back some happy memories. Thanks for listening. Take care and goodbye.